would like to uh, welcome you and thank you all for coming. My name is Camille Charles. I'm professor of sociology and Africana studies. Uh, I'm also faculty director for the Penn First Plus initiative here at Penn. Uh, and it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce my former graduate student, uh, Marianne Riga. Marianne is jointly appointed in the Department of Sociology and the Institute for African American Studies at the University of Georgia. And her book, the, the Hollywood Jim Crow, The Racial Politics of the Movie Industry, is an analysis of how everyday racial hierarchies in Hollywood uh, thematically mirror Jim Crow practices. As Hollywood decision makers perceive blackness as unbankable, then marginalize, segregate, and stigmatize black film directors, racial inequality appears to be an artifact of logical economic decisions and global cultural preferences rather than a product of overt discrimination. Revealing how racism operates in a major culture industry, the book illustrates an important shift in contemporary explicit racial discourse that masks racial inequality with economic and cultural rationales. More broadly, her research and teaching interests include race and ethnicity, film and media, digital sociology, and African American society. Other ongoing research examines the symbolic inclusion of racial groups via ideologies, narratives, and emotions as well as the possibilities and perils of digital technologies for racial inclusion politics. In addition, she serves on the editorial board for Social Currents, the official journal of the Southern Sociological Society. Uh, again, I'm extremely pleased and delighted to be able to welcome Marianne and to have watched this begin as a dissertation proposal oh so many years ago and to, and to be the great book it is today. So welcome, Marianne Riga. Thank you. Sorry, I can't stay, but I'll watch the video. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming out in the rain. It's always hard to, to make that check, so I really do appreciate that. And thank you to the Department for Africana Studies that I've witnessed the department go from a center to a department status, and it really did make a big change in my own trajectory at Penn because having that extra support from the department was very important for me, and they're always here for students, so it's very great that they're able to become a department and to provide extra support for everyone. And I'm also very grateful that my advisor, Dr. Charles, was able to introduce me because she's provided a lot of support for UPenn as well. And thank you to Real Black for coming out and filming this for their YouTube page. And also thanks to the Penn Bookstore. So I'm going to just give an overview of the book broadly, and then we can have questions or comments afterwards. So the book project started as a dissertation, as my advisor said, and really it grew out of this interest in representation in Hollywood. I, when I was at Penn as a graduate student, I went to Cannes Film Festival through the study abroad with the undergrad and graduate program jointly. And so I was able to see American films as well as global films. And I was really interested in how there was not a lot of diverse representation of American film and American cinema in international venues like the Cannes Film Festival. And so that really grew my interest in trying to understand more about representation in Hollywood and how that took place and how, to what extent, you know, are directors able to get their films to global audiences? So that really drew my interest. And 2019 is a really fascinating year because it is the 50th anniversary of the first black director in Hollywood. And that was Gordon Park Sr. when he adapted his book, The Learning Tree into a movie for, with Warner Brothers. And so this is an interesting time, I think, a fascinating time for this book to come out because it really allows us to revisit then, you know, to what extent have black directors been able to integrate into Hollywood and then what does that look like? What does their integration look like? So I want to also say that in the book I talk about other directors like Asian and Latino as well and white directors. I'm going to focus more so on black directors for this talk and talking about their inclusion. And most of the book is about black directors, although I do talk about others in relation to their plight and their pathways. So I thought it was really interesting that 50 years later to examine the state of integration. And so what I looked at was this idea of a hierarchy in Hollywood. Because when you think about representation, you think about maybe symbols, you know, the idea that there's a presence or an absence of people. You might also think about numbers, counting numerically what percentage of people are in a specific occupation. <laughs> you can think also about civic representation, and by that I mean the representation in our cultural narratives and myths. For example, if you're part of the Hall of Fame, then maybe you're part of that culture, of that institution. 
But I'm also interested in this idea of hierarchy and representation and what that means. And we think about hierarchy, you think about your quality of representation, your quality of life. So are you directing big budget movies or small budget movies? Are you directing movies in particular genres? So I think for Hollywood, there's a question of what is the quality of representation like? Even as we see greater visibility of directors, maybe our quality of representation isn't where we think it needs to be. So I really, as I, as I started to look at data, I looked at data from IMDB, which is the Internet Movie Database. I looked at data from other online websites like Box Office Mojo. And I was really looking at what the representation looked like beyond just numbers. I also look at numbers and per percentages, but also what does it look like in terms of this hierarchy? You know, what genres are people directing and also what movies, what kinds of budgets are they working with? So I was interested in those kinds of questions. And what I found, and that's why the title of the book is called The Hollywood Jim Crow, because I found that there was this underlying hierarchy that was similar to Jim Crow, period. So as you might know, the period of legal segregation in which you know, whites were privileged and disadvantaged blacks and other mi racial minority groups. And with Jim Crow, we think about this hierarchy as well with whites receiving the better resources, better access to resources, such as better housing, schooling, employment. And then we see that in this contemporary era that those overt or maybe explicit hierarchies have vanished on the surface but we do see a lot underneath the surface and beneath the surface, this veneer of consensus that we might have that we may say that there's a lot of equality, but underneath the surface, if we really look at the, the, those kinds of hierarchies of representation, then we do see a lot of inequality still existing in Hollywood, despite the visibility of a lot of directors. So I was really trying to link the book, and of course it's a play on Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, just to understand how in this era we do have this lasting sense of inequality and what that means across different dimensions. So of course her book discussed mass incarceration and some, to some extent policing. And so this is looking at Hollywood and asking the question of to what extent is racial inequality still prevalent in Hollywood today? So I think it's a very fascinating time that we have to look at the idea of racial inequality. Are we in a post-racial world? Or does race still matter? And in what sense does it matter? How does it matter? So given that, I'll, I want to read from the book some parts to allow you to understand this pathway and this line of inquiry that I'm taking. This is from just the introduction called Race Matters in Hollywood. The movie The Magnificent Seven, an action-adventure western, starred the veteran actor Denzel Washington alongside the less well-known white actors Chris Pratt and Ethan Hawke. The movie was directed by Antoine Fuqua, who, like Denzel Washington, has a number of successful movies under his belt. Despite their combined experience, there was a hesitance among Hollywood insiders, those with great influence on the decision-making processes in the production of popular cinema, to produce The Magnificent Seven for a big budget with Washington starring and Fuqua directing. In the following quotation, Steve, and I use these pseudonyms for the Hollywood insiders because another part of the book is the fact that I drew a lot of these quotations from Hollywood insiders from the WikiLeaks of, of the major corporations. So I was able to then see the inside story in terms of how they communicate with one another in private, seemingly private correspondences. And so that's where a lot of the context comes from by really trying to link these inequalities to the actual words that Hollywood insiders who are like just people who are working in the industry but have positions of power and how they really draw on those conversations and talk about race. So here's one of those quotations. Love the script, plot, characters all incredibly well written and with Denzel and Antoine it feels compelling. My concern is that Equalizer was 36% Caucasian and 35% African American. I wonder if we we're to look at successful Westerns like True Grit, how much of that audience was Caucasian? I honestly don't know. But if I had to guess, it would be more Caucasian and less African American. So if in the last week we're figuring out what audiences to double down on, like we did with Equalizer, I want to be sure that audiences has the, right, the elements they need to buy the tickets. Do we double down on African American audiences? And if so, does that audience show up in a big enough way at Westerns to make our number? Or do we push older Caucasian males towards an Denzel Antoine Fuqua movie? And if so, will they show up in a big enough way? Obviously, Westerns pose an initial set of concerns, but I'm not sure the pedigree is the perfect fit for the lovers of the genre. And having just been the contemporary cool popcorn movie to the Tombstone's bleak old-fashioned movie, I don't feel as excited as I'd like about based on this fiscal layout. So I, I'll continue to read here. 
While Steve is a pseudonym for a Hollywood insider, his words and the concerns he voices are real. His momentary praise for the talents of Fuquan Washington is immediately followed by skepticism for their possibility of success. In particular, he expresses uncertainty about the financial outlook of the Magnificent Seven for reasons that appear to be outwardly related to race. Believing that the audience for all Western genre movies skews Caucasian, Steve imagines a predominantly white audience for the Magnificent Seven. He, he reasons, therefore, that the casting and directing should also skew Caucasian in order to capitalize on this target audience. As he puts it, to be sure that the audience has the elements, they need to buy the tickets, and to be certain, the pedigree is the perfect fit for the lovers of the genre. Here, the elements in the pedigree implicitly refer to the racial makeup of the cast and director with respect to imagined audience desires. So this idea that we're lumping together race with economic considerations is a recurring thought in the emails and correspondences between Hollywood insiders. So as, Steve's, as Steve's remarks indicates, race enters the conversation long before the box office numbers roll in, oftentimes even before a movie script receives the green light for production. So if we have this question about whether race still matters in Hollywood, we can see not only with the data that race matters, but also with the very conversations that Hollywood insiders have amongst one another, that race is oftentimes a, t a concern and it's always expressed, whether it's expressed before or after the film is shot, whether there's a green light for the movie, whether there's a discussion about the distribution of the movie to foreign audiences or to domestic audiences, race always seems to be a concern in how movies are made and produced and distributed. And I call this part labeling black unbankable because how we see Hollywood, direct, Hollywood insiders dealing with race is that they seem to think that race, bankability, economics, profit are linked. And so we see that the language of labeling black casts, black actors, black films, or themes even unbankable in many cases and also doing the opposite with films that have white actors or white stars, suggesting that those would be more profitable. And so one example of this is how Hollywood directors look at advertising movies. So the unbankable label affects a movie's marketing strategy. Hollywood executives conceive of small specific audiences for black films and large general audiences for white films that often go racially unmarked. In turn, Hollywood executives envision race-segmented audiences and thus heavily market black movies to black audiences. What transpires is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Race marketing plans reinforce the perception that black movies are unbankable to non-black audiences. So an example of this is marketing the movie No Good Deed, which starred Idris Elba, and About Last Night, which starred Kevin Hart. So marketing those movies on programs like Queen Latifah, 106 in Park, which is a music program, Apollo Live, Sisters of Hip Hop, Sisterhood of Hip Hop, Atlanta X's premiere, Love and Hip Hop finale, movies like, um, or television shows like The Braxton Family Values. So picking these race targeted audiences and marketing black movies or movies with black actors specifically to those audiences and not to other audiences. And so in some cases, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy in that it really does shut off the kinds of audiences that this movie could potentially have. So another way this Hollywood Jim Crow operates is the kinds of movies in which black directors direct are more likely not to be these major studio movies. So we think about the major studios are Warner Brothers, Universal, Columbia, 20th Century Fox, Disney, and Paramount. And less often they're seen directing movies distributed by those companies and more often by smaller companies or by studio independents. Um, companies like Sony Screen Gems, for example, or Fox Searchlight. And so we see them ghettoized into directing for certain companies and getting distribu distribution that is largely suppressed. Because if you think about the larger companies, they have more access to resources, they have bigger budgets, and that's another way that we see this modern Holly Hollywood Jim Crow operating, is that they have select budgets for their movies, but also uh, narrow advertising markets. And this, if you ask the question about intersectionality, which a lot of people would, you know, how does this then affect female directors, especially women of color? And so for black female directors, we see that there are a very small percentage of directors across the board. So less than 2% of directors are black females. And they are less likely to have any representation in any given year. So in one year, you might see a director of a major studio picture, 
and many years you go without seeing a director. So some of the directors that people know now are like Ava DuVernay, who recently had a $100 million picture with A Wrinkle in Time, and that's the highest, gross, highest budgeted film directed by a black female. Before that, it was Angela Robinson's Herbie Fully Loaded, and that was a $50 million picture. And so if you take those two, but then you go to the third one, then there's a significant decrease there. So you see that black women don't typically have big budget pictures, although you do have a couple of highlight directors that you can pin to that have those budgets. But in general, you can't really name more than two black women that have had $50 million or more to direct a movie. So we do see that inequality is really exacerbated when it comes to black women. And even for black men, there's not a lot of big budget pictures that they're directing. You have a couple of exceptions with people like Antoine Fuqua, but you don't see many of them entering into that upper echelon of directing. Whereas you see a lot more white directors, especially white male directors, who have those budgets of 200 million or more directing movies. And that's a place where we still see very rigid hierarchies where blacks are not able to get into those big budget movies. And one part of that is the superhero genre. Some people might talk about Black Panther, and so that's really on the level of an exception in terms of having a black director direct a movie that's such a big movie, and even having a black cast get a budget that's over 200 million is really unlikely. That was probably the only film that we could see that's a majority black cast that has such a large budget. So in Hollywood, there's a lot of ways in which blacks are not able to integrate in 2019. And one way is really when we talk about the lucrative pictures, especially the genres like science fiction and the blockbuster franchise movies, we see that very few are directing those big budget movies. And there's, there's sometimes a debate about should we focus so much on big budget movies? But I think they're important for many reasons. I mean, one is having a director have the experience of working with a large budget. I think it does enable them to further their career in a lot of ways so that they're able to work with large groups of people, work with certain special effects that you couldn't have on a smaller budget, have a little more variability and creativity involved in terms of having those resources. So I think it matters in that way. Another way it matters is that if you're successful with a big budget movie, then people really look at you as a successful director. And then you're able to then have more projects. So sometimes there's an obstruction of their careers where you have these obstacles, and then people aren't really viewing them as someone who could handle a big budget picture. So it's kind of one of those catch-22s that no one really thinks you can, you're capable of doing something until you've actually done it. And so that's where I think that matters in some, in some way, the integration into those, those commercially successful movies. And so with, with Black Panther, that was one accomplishment, I think, for Ryan Coogler to be able to handle that budget. And people really look at him as a director, you know, notwithstanding people's personal opinions about the film, but people look at him as someone who could handle a big budget movie, at least handling the cast and the personnel. Whereas you might not look at directors, especially directors of color and, and um, female directors as people who can, have, can handle that kind of movie, only because we just haven't seen it. So it's not that they can, but because we don't see that representation, there's always a question about can people do something. So I think it's very important that we are able to see a variety of pictures, as I'll talk about a little later. So now I'll read a quote from John Singleton, who recently passed away. But he had a very lucrative career in Hollywood. He also was one of Hollywood's bigger critics, as um, someone who's directed a lot of movies there. He, he was very vocal as well about how Hollywood, he feels, put him in a position to where he, and I also like looked at interviews. I didn't conduct any interviews personally, but I looked at a lot of the popular press interviews that directors had, had written and had conducted. And so I draw on those in the book as well. And he really felt that there was this debate, you know, due to this un unbankable label about how could he do the movies that he wanted to do in Hollywood, direct the movies he wanted to direct, but given this barrier. And he talks about this in this quote. So John Singleton distinguishes between Hollywood movies and his own movies. Quote, I can do action pictures with a lot of different people in them, and I can go back and do my core stuff. And then this is um, my writing. Making a similar distinction, Reginald Hudlin stresses the unique challenges African Americans face as they progress through the ranks of Hollywood directing. And so Hudlin is another director. And he says, when I look at my peers, like Spike Lee and John Singleton, we all reached the same point where we had great success doing personal films, and then all of a sudden, Hollywood said, now we want you to do our movies. We still wanted to do what we wanted to do, but if you want to work, 
you'll do our movies. We each hit this point of frustration that none of us could figure out how to work around. So that's Hudlin's own words about how he felt working in the industry. And so I think it would be interesting. Some people ask, should I, um, since I didn't interview directors for this book, should I go and interview them? I said, well, that would be really fascinating. I don't know if working directors could talk um, without, like, um, I guess, off the record or on the record. You know, we, we love to see the juicy quotations on the record, but I think it may be hard to talk while you're still trying to work. But these are people who did express their discontent with Hollywood while they were still working. So it's very courageous and bold of them to do so. So I'll read a little bit more from this section. Both Singleton and Hudlin distinguish between personal films and Hollywood films. For them, getting work and sustaining a directing career largely implies doing Hollywood movies. Seldom do Hollywood executives give a black director a, a big budget to make a movie with a black cast or theme. Perhaps at some point, directors realize that their continued success and likelihood of securing future work in Hollywood, especially work with big budgets and for major studios, depend on their concentrating on fewer personal black films and more mainstream Hollywood, or white, or at the very least, multiracial movies. In exchange for integration into Hollywood, directing films with bigger budgets and in more commercial genres, black directors are pressured to abandon the types of films on which many of them built their careers, films with black casts and themes, and instead pursue films with black casts, themes, or cultural experiences. That's great um, music here. I can loosen up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that they, you know, this question about, well, what is integration now? And so I think a lot of them are questioning this idea of to what extent is integration then moving us away from the kinds of movies that we want to direct or the movies that we're honing our talent on? I think that's a big question because a lot of directors and John Singleton's career trajectory himself actually points to him directing the people know the Hood trilogy, what, what films are involved in that. So it's Poetic Justice. There's um, Higher Learning and Boys in the Hood, which were his first few movies in the 90s, and that's what people refer to as the Hood Trilogy because those were films that are really just personal to him and about you know, where he grew up and really things that he could relate to. But as he progressed in his career, he was doing other films. You know, he started to do Shaft, which is more of a Hollywood movie, the remake of the black exploitation movie. He also did Rosewood, which is a, kind of a historical period drama about um, an incident in Florida. Yeah, and so then after that, he went on to do other movies, when, what he calls like Hollywood movies, or what Reginald Hudlin also calls Hollywood movies, where he's directing this movie with Taylor Lautner starring in the movie, and then he directed Four Brothers. And so he goes on to do, and that was Abduction, people have seen Abduction. And he also did Too Fast, Too Furious, which was one of those, I guess now it's a global franchise, they're on like Fast and Furious 100 now. And so he also did those movies. But you see that there's this trajectory where he's not really directing movies about black themes, movies about black culture, black cast, and to be an American filmmaker, that's an integral part of American culture, black culture. And so we're asking ourselves, I guess the directors are asking themselves, to what extent is directing then in Hollywood and this idea of integration, to what extent is then their uh, lessening of a representation of black culture as they become more successful directors, as they are given higher budgets, of course, with um, Black Panther notwithstanding, because I always talk about how that's the only, and then people also critique, like this is a fictional representation of you know, this fictional Africa. So again, this is not a historical Africa representation, and this is not an African-American representation by a black director with a big budget. So we always ask ourselves, you know, so what kinds of movies then are black directors directing when they get big budgets? They're not really directing movies that are like realistic kind of movies about black culture, or even if it's a fantasy movie, is it, this is um, with Black Panther, it's a Marvel picture, which again, is not from his own creative standpoint. It's really um, a comic book adaptation. And so of course there's some variability there. But what kinds of movies then are they being prevented from directing as they aspire to have these larger budgets? That's really part of the question of this sense of a black stigma. And this chapter is about the stigma of blackness and to what extent does that impede their careers and impede their, their directing? And one thing that they do often is have to then label movies as universal and human. You know, some of the criticism they get is that, you know, is this movie, if it has black cast or if it has black actors or about black culture, is it a movie that everyone would like? Is it a movie that could attract larger audiences? So sometimes they have to label their movies in a way in which they believe it will attract larger audiences. There's really this dilemma that then that they face when they're trying to get into larger budgets. And that's what I talk about in part of the part of the 
story. Finally, there's this question about, well, what should we do about this problem, this Hollywood Jim Crow? Where should we go from here? And I think, it's, I think there's a dual pathway. I don't think there's a singular pathway. For one, I think integrating into Hollywood does matter because there is a nation and you know blacks are part of this nation and so we need to have this representation and have it be authentically black and unapologetically, some would say, black. And also for that to be part of the Hollywood canon and the American cinematic canon. So I think that's very important. I don't think that there should be some kind of segregationist pull away from Hollywood, but I think there should be a lot of attempt to integrate into Hollywood. So this quote here is from Spike Lee, where he talks about representation, and he is pointing out the racial imbalance in executive positions in Hollywood studios. And he says, look, take away the big stars, Will Smith and Denzel, and look at the people who have a green light vote. Where are the people of color? That's what it comes down to. How many people, when they have those meetings and vote on what movies get made, how many people of color are in those meetings? That's not to say that's the only way to get a film made, but you're talking about Hollywood specifically here. And if you want to get a film made, it has to get greenlit. And I want, to, I want someone to tell me, who is a person of color who has a green light vote in this industry today? I'm talking about the people sitting in the room who have read the script, looking at the full package, who's in it, how much is it going to cost, how much is it going to make, the people who have that vote. There are no people of color who have that. So here he's talking about this sense of hierarchy, and he's, he's really questioning the upper ranks of Hollywood. You know, if Hollywood is going to be the American film industry, this multicultural American film industry, then it, there should have representation at all ranks, so executive ranks as well as directors and producers and all the other little positions that people don't think about, like makeup artists and costume designers and all of those other little positions that unless you're at a film school or on a film set, you won't really know. Even hairstylists, you know, there's so many little positions around and they're not little because of course we, you know, we look at the Hollywood production and see it as one seamless production, but of course there are little, little pieces that are involved. And so he's really saying that there should be representation at every rank that's diverse and that's inclusive. And he specifically pointing to the executive ranks because he feels as though they have all the power to green light movies, that if there's a movie to be made, then people, executives, should be able to green light that and he wants that to be very diversified. So he's, he's not alone in, in expressing that concern. And I think since this kind of dialogue happened, there have been a lot more inclusivity in Hollywood. For example, with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, there was a black, direct, a black um, head of that as well, and there was a lot of discussion about getting the Oscars diversified. And I'll give a quote here that points on that, and this is from a Hollywood insider. In this quote, the Hollywood insider and others were having a conversation about the film 12 Years a Slave, and this is before it won an Oscar. And they were considering would it actually be able to win an Oscar, given the makeup, the demographic makeup of the Academy. So she voices her observation in a correspondence to Hollywood executives and other insiders. And she says, 12 Years is truly a brilliant film with a compelling story. This film is made by a Brit that exposes the darkest hidden history of America, exposing a cruel and brutal segment of our white society. These plantation owners are as terrible as the Nazis, who are the only acceptable cinematic villains. The Academy's experience of watching this film is not pleasant. Some will not see it because of the violence. Eventually, they have to, to vote. If they put it in their DVD, they may fast forward or turn it off. So will they vote for a best picture so difficult to watch? Many others who have seen it tout the brilliant filmmaking, but are a bit embarrassed by the story, and more importantly, did not enjoy watching it. My point is, is this a story American cultural bell ringers want to send around the world as the best story in the best picture? I think the voters are patiently waiting for an excuse to vote for another film. In their hearts, they are uncomfortable sending a global message from a Brit that we are or were terrible people. And so this quote I think is very loaded in terms of this analysis of someone thinking about not just, again, we're not really, when we think about the Oscars, we're not necessarily evaluating the quality of the filmmaking, but obviously there's a lot of politics involved in what movies get chosen. And you can look at a lot of the best picture winners and just examine what are the politics of the time and how does that impact who votes for a movie and who doesn't vote for that movie. So I think that people are not only 
evaluating the merits of movies, but also expressing their own subjectivities and their own opinions and ideologies when it comes to voting for movies. And I don't think that, I, sometimes we like to talk about objectivity and the idea that no one brings their own self to these decisions, even when it comes to Hollywood executives. But I'd like to err on the side of everyone brings their own subjectivities because that's usually how it is. So I, I'd rather just say that we should all be able to bring our own subjectivities to the table when we're coming to make decisions about movies. So I think representation is important for that reason, that you know, we need to hear from this idea of a multicultural nation and let everyone bring their subjectivities to, to bear on all of these decisions as they're important for affecting who is representing our culture and in what cases. And so some people can disagree with me <laughs> there and say that they're perfectly um, objective, but I think that we're all probably a little bit subjective when we make decisions. And sometimes we can't help, help that. So I think it's just important that we have different, different people who are representing us when it comes to voting, when it comes to having those meetings at the table, as Spike Lee would say, because it's important that we get to hear all of those subjectivities and then maybe that will help us make a better decision that could in the end be more objective than if we just air out what our positions are and our positionality, as some would say, what they are. So I think representation in Hollywood is important for those reasons that we, we want different kinds of movies in the film industry, especially with large budgets. But I think there's also this path that, that we should take that involves also having an industry that's countering Hollywood, or that's out, maybe not countering, but that's also producing movies on the, on the par of Hollywood. So I don't think that we should uniformly and unilaterally rely on Hollywood to make these big budget pictures, but why can't there be some other institution that makes pictures that are $200 million, and so we're all forced to watch what other people think in these, with these big budget movies? Because one of the allures of, of Hollywood, one of the allures of Hollywood is that they're able to make these really seamless, pictures because there's a lot of money and a lot of editing involved. And so we're all seduced by that kind of filmmaking, whether or not we actually enjoy the movie. I know we've all sat through really horrible superhero movies where there's really no story, but there's just a lot of explosions and a lot of chases. And so we're just really drawn into those kinds of movies just because of the cinematic qualities and not necessarily because it's a great film. So I think the money matters in that case because it enables people to make a very seamless Film, and I think it will be interesting to see movies that are from a different perspective that aren't made in the same Hollywood canon that we have. So I argue for, in addition to representation in Hollywood, I argue for a black cinema collective. And of course this is not necessarily just the idea of a black cinema collective, but you can think of this for any kind of multicultural or any kind of, any kind of area that, in which we're underrepresented in Hollywood. So idea is a collective of people who feel underrepresented in order for them to have their voices heard. So ideally, a black cinema collective would, number one, define what ideals, visions, and narratives should be depicted for mass audiences. Number two, foster the development of directors in their films through the, throughout the production process. Three, feature forgotten or invisible works of African Americans, including black films of various genres and also adaptations of black writers. So all those books that are great, but we don't really get them adapted. Content really produced, yet desired by audiences. Four, see those films through the distribution and exhibition phases, because I think there's, there's not enough of the, on the production side of independent cinema, but I think there are a lot more could be done to think about not only having independent filmmakers have their own films, but actually you know, have a meeting around a table and say, well, what kind of movies do we want to see in the black community and other communities? What kind of movies do we want to see? And let's, let's be proactive about instead of everyone making their own independent film, let's try to make this one really huge movie every single year and really make decisions about what that should be. So seeing it through the exhibition and distribution phases, and if, if you know, partnering with Hollywood to distribute movies, there's this great distribution system already ongoing and theater system, so that part I think is already laid out and just partnering with them, and the way that someone like Tyler Perry gets his movies distributed with Lionsgate and others. So currently, independent cinema is not at all a formalized system, but rather an assortment of individual project, projects by merging or established directors, producers, writers, and filmmakers. The projects are typically small in scale and shaped by random events, rather than molded by organized regular occurrences. So as a whole, there is not as much planning and future outlook 
when it comes to the projects collectively. So there's no meticulous design production slate of movies emerging from a cent central institution, only one-off productions by individuals. So that's really, I think, the call to arms here is, I think, understanding what are some of those areas where we'd like to see a black-directed movie. You know, maybe if, if there's a science fiction movie and we don't have any science fiction movies that have black casts, maybe that's one place where some, some, you know, everyone says Oprah because Oprah's the billionaire. Or everyone looks to Oprah, but you know, how, however to pull money together in order to make that picture outside of getting financing from Hollywood. Or there could be the work of some writer that could be an adaptation, even movies about slavery, like with 12 Years a Slave, as the Oscar, um, the Hollywood insider who talked about the Oscar mentioned, it's by a British director, you know, so what are the perspectives that directors with the history of slavery in mind, what are their opinions and thoughts, and I, th I don't know that Hollywood would fund a movie of that vein. So trying to think of movies that we would love to have that are outside of what Hollywood has traditionally funded and trying to find out ways to pull money together to get that to happen. So more collaboration on that side. So thank you for your attentiveness and I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments and questions. Um, so, we're having Harriet Tubman's coming out this year, so we, we do have an American director tackling that, but it's a British actress, so of course there's going to be Twitter <laughs> on that, but, uh, yeah. you know, since you published the book, a few things have disrupted Hollywood uh, completely, most, most noticeably Netflix. Do you have any opinion about the large migration of uh, black films, or large availability, I should say, of black film uh, opportunities in, the, in that streaming space. Yeah, I think it's important and wonderful that there is that there is another space, or other spaces, you can say, if you're talking about the digital world, beyond Netflix, and Netflix included, where you have blacks making movies, you know, black directors and black creatives making movies. I wonder to what extent are those movies, like, like um, the one criticism would be there are those movies like still small in scale when it comes to their production qualities, you know? So I wonder, is that enough of a challenge in that, in that respect? Because I guess with the, with the idea of talent going to Netflix, usually a lot of the actors are going to whoever's paying them the most. And so I don't know that we have as much of, of a draw for the best black talent on Netflix. Although in some cases there are a lot of movies that are being made that that could be in competition for, for that. So I think there is a potential for digital spaces like Netflix to be a competitive space that counters Hollywood and that could also be a place for people to make, make creative and transformative cinema. Yeah. Uh, you did a very good job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what I don't like and what I hear, and you had mentioned something about it, like, well, with Twitter, um, why do we <coughs> hate on other black people in, who are, in the diaspora, mm -hmm. uh, just because they're not born and raised in the United States. I mean, our ancestors weren't born and raised in the United States either. You know, at one point. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't understand why that happens. Um, yeah, and it's almost like you know, they're okay. So we have the whole Jim Crow Hollywood thing. So we're actually just doing that to our own black brothers and sisters. I think when we say, oh, well, that one's from England or that one's from here or. What does it matter? They're mm -hmm. black. They mm -hmm. face the same discrimination that we do in yeah. other countries. So, Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think part of it is the idea of representation being so narrow and having few spaces. So if you have only a few spaces and everyone's kind of clamoring for that, those spaces. So I think one of the problems is that there are just not a lot of not a lot of positions or not a lot of roles for blacks in, in Hollywood, so there's a lot of competition for those spaces. And I think the other part is the idea that there could be some kind of misrepresentation. And that, that is not necessarily going with the person's identity, but I think there could be some, kinds of, some kind of concern for whether people from other continents would understand enough about, especially when they're playing, like in the case of Harriet Tubman, when they're playing a figure who's so important to American society. So they wonder, do they have that knowledge? Or are they going to study? Yeah. Do we have that knowledge? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there's, sometimes there's a, there's a sense that people 
think that people have a certain knowledge, whether or not they do. So that, that is a question of do the people have that knowledge? I, th I think that's really what it comes down to when it, when it comes down to representation of actors, is that whoever is playing the role has to then do the work of getting to know the character and getting to know whether or not that character is a good fit for them. So I think that the work in the setting does come into play, but there is a tendency to then jump on identity politics, and, and I think that's where your question goes. And then just one last thing. Um, I noticed I was watching today, I forgot what show it was, but they were showing where they're doing a movie about uh, Venus and Serena's father. And oh, now okay. they're going to be, oh, well, they may be yeah. using Will Smith to represent him. Oh, wow. Your complexion. And Will Smith is you know, light, lighter. Mm -hmm. You know, and so people are upset about that mm -hmm. and where the casting is becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's always that question of who, who should play who is always a is always a very contentious issue when it comes to representing black characters, partly because of the history and also because of the misrepresent the tendency that people could misrepresent the history. Yeah, and then the issue of colorism. Are we even for a lot of darker skin actors? They feel like they're overlooked by people who are lighter because of issues like colorism. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you were really talking about the new Jim Crow of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, Marion Van Poopers when he did the Posse. We get funding for it in the United States City to go to Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good movie because it shows brothers in powerful positions. And we have this problem all the time. There's a brother that was looking at doing an authentic movie about the revolution, American Revolution. And, you know, Philadelphia was majority American Indian in that period. But you will have a hard time getting funding yeah. for an authentic movie about anything going to Hollywood. So what are we going to do about this new Jim Crow? That's yeah, yeah, so my, my thought is that the one, the one part is getting more executives in Hollywood who could appreciate those kinds of stories and, and open up their wallets for those kinds of stories, you know, executives that want to represent that multicultural U.S. in that larger perspective. And the other part is trying to get a lot of people, whether it's like grassroots funding, I don't, sometimes you use the words grassroots, you know, how do you, how do you raise, like if you think about politics and political campaigns, how do you get a few dollars from each people, three dollars a person, four dollars a person, you know, is it possible to raise 50 million dollars to make a movie like that by doing it grassroots? So trying different models to get movies made, I think is the other part of that advice. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you.